Welcome to this video. Our subject is terrestrial geophysics for archaeology and particularly electromagnetic induction survey with the EM38 series of instruments manufactured by Geonics Limited in Mississauga, Ontario. Now it has to be said that the electromagnetic induction method or EMI is not at all as popular as passive magnetic methods like magnetometry. I think this is our loss and I want to show you why EMI surveys and specifically the geonics instruments deserve a second look. By way of background, I got my start in remote sensing in the late 1990s in the UK when the data logger was a notebook and a stubby pencil. A lot has changed since then. In recent years, we've seen the widespread availability of free aerial LIDAR in many Western countries and the introduction of increasingly sophisticated aerial vehicles and software supporting archaeological research and communication. After a slow start, archaeologists are now more regularly using ground-penetrating radar. We've integrated each of these methods, and others, into our research program, and I'd be happy to discuss any of them with you. But for today, we'll focus on the workhorses of our terrestrial geophysics stable, the Geonics EM38 series. My introduction to this technology occurred about 20 years ago when I met Duncan McNeil, former owner and president of Geonics Limited. We share an interest in early colonial history and he thought his equipment might help us detect and map sites. And he was right. While our geophysical research activities have since gone international, the core of our work remains here in Nova Scotia, where we are engaged in mapping early colonial sites. French immigrants began moving to this region in the 17th century and gradually became known as Acadians, renowned for their reliance on dikeland agriculture. In the middle of the 18th century, in the lead up to the Seven Years' War, Nova Scotia's British government deported them citing security concerns. Soldiers burned many of their communities, effectively erasing much of what they had built. EMI, electromagnetic induction, is an especially useful method for detecting and mapping Acadian sites, but not only Acadian sites. After briefly describing the principles behind this method, I'll outline our approach to survey and data processing with examples from three sites. Geonics has been manufacturing EMI instruments now for several decades, and we've used a couple of different models, the EM38B and a successor, the EM38 Mark II. These are near-surface instruments useful for detecting features within about a meter of the surface, but other configurations exist for deeper penetration. Generally speaking, these induction instruments produce a primary electromagnetic field that induces a secondary field in the ground, which is in turn measured with a receiver. Measured differences between the primary and secondary fields allow us to make inferences about what lies beneath. Something I love about these instruments is that they really offer two types of geophysical information in one survey. A quadrature phase response, which measures electrical conductance, or conductivity, how easily an electric current passes through the soil, which is measured in millisiemens, and an in-phase response, which measures how easily a soil can be magnetized. This is measured in parts per thousand or parts per million. This second property, magnetic susceptibility, is of special value in archaeology because human activity enriches soil magnetism in several ways. In my experience, the two most important are 1. Architectural material, such as building stone and especially brick, which can be highly magnetically susceptible. Our experiments have uh, repeatedly shown that even very small amounts of such material can be detected. And second, burning. Burning enhances soil magnetism by converting hematite, a common but not very magnetic iron oxide, to magnetite and maghemite, which is highly magnetic and quite durable. 
The chemical process by which this occurs was first described by Eugène Le Born and is known as the Le Born effect. Building and burning are commonly associated with human activity, and you don't need much of either to leave a geophysical trace. Of course, detecting that trace, sometimes amid abundant natural and or anthropogenic interference, can sometimes be challenging. So we'll now turn to survey methodology. Geophysical prospection is a little bit like fishing. Just as the size of the fish determines the choice of net, the size of the geophysical target, and I suppose the degree of refinement needed in the resulting map, will help determine the character of the survey grid. Aside from choice of instrument, the layout of the survey grid and the sampling strategy are probably the next most important factors determining the character of the data. Here there are trade-offs. The tighter the interline spacing, or transect interval, and sample density, the more highly resolved the resulting map. Conversely, the larger the transect interval and the lower the sample density, the cruder the picture. It's probably analogous to a pixel count in a digital image, or if you prefer, the width of the steel mesh used to screen back dirt. The wider the mesh, the easier the screening, but the more likely we are to miss something. And so it is with geophysics. Dense survey grids offer a more highly resolved picture, but they take a lot more time. So with target size in mind, is it a village, a house, or a hearth? We have to consider whether the goal is simple detection or prospection or more high resolution mapping. My practice has been to conduct extensive prospection grade surveys with no greater than two meter transect intervals, scaling down to more refined mapping surveys at 50 centimeter transect intervals as needed. Zigzag or alternating surveys are okay, but will generally introduce a modest heading error, which will produce a zipper effect in the data. We can compensate for this to some degree with software, and it can be mitigated in the field by walking slowly, but it is there. For the best control in EMI surveys, as with GPR, I recommend walking one-way transects. This doubles the survey time, unfortunately, but if we are looking for subtle features and want the best quality results, we might as well just accept it and get to work. Otherwise, the data loggers can usually be set to accept up to 10 readings per second, and that's what I often do, under the principle that more data is better than less. The output files with EMI are actually quite small, unlike GPR, and consist of tables of X, Y, and Z data, in which X and Y are space-time markers, and Z is the measure of conductivity or magnetic susceptibility. The data output is essentially a long, narrow spreadsheet. A final word on grids. When I started surveying, we had to establish formal survey grids and use guidelines and flags and all sorts of other means to keep the instrument on track and control the rate of data capture. These instruments don't have onboard GPS, and sampling at a rate of 5 to 10 readings per second requires marking the data at fixed intervals to compensate for changes in walking speed during the survey, especially over long lines or when on slopes. But the advent of relatively inexpensive and accurate GPS allows us to dispense with grids, at least for coarse prospection surveys. Non-ferrous range poles, or those plastic reflector things that you buy at Canadian Tire to mark the end of your driveway, help maintain transect accuracy, and sometimes it's possible to use your footprints in the grass or on a plowed field to keep those transects properly aligned. Surveys with this method are much faster to collect and process than the grid-based method. There are many ways to visualize and interrogate this kind of data, but my approach generally follows a two-step process. Step one involves scrutinizing line data and sometimes correcting survey geometry in the manufacturer's DAT38 software. 
I recommend dwelling on this form of data because we often see things here that are less evident in the 2D contour plots more regularly encountered in site reports and articles. Here are some typical survey lines showing the conductivity response in red and the concurrent magnetic susceptibility plot in blue. The dialogue here between these data sets is highly instructive and readily apparent in this software. For example, the magnetic high corresponding to a conductivity low is a typical response to a buried stone feature, such as a foundation. Here we see a series of survey lines exhibiting a high magnetic response with no corresponding conductivity low, suggesting a linear burned feature. In fact, I suspect we're bisecting a wall of a wooden building here that has been burned, but it did not have a stone foundation. From DAT38, we export a grid file of the data for further processing in another software package. For step two, I use Surfer by Golden Software, which is a gridding and contouring program. It also supports point cloud data, incidentally, giving you access to LiDAR files. In Surfer, we open the grid, apply filters, and reinterpolation, then generate maps in the form of contour plots, shaded relief, or 3D surface models. Each of these has its own pros and cons and could easily be the subject for a separate talk, but from here you can export JPEGs or GeoTIFFs for onward analysis and display in your preferred GIS software package. So we'll move on now to our examples. This is a field in central Grand Pré, Nova Scotia, formerly the site of an Acadian village established in the 1680s and destroyed in 1755. Since then, it has been plowed flat, but our surveys indicate there is a very well-preserved Acadian house here. This house was likely burned after the 1755 deportation, which would have contributed to its magnetic enrichment, but a major source of magnetism here is from the use of mafic rock in the foundation. The Laborn effect is also expressed in the hearth oven complex at the west side of the building. Fieldstone and ferrous waste dumped in the cellar post-abandonment is an additional source of enrichment and the cause of the data spikes we are seeing, most of which are saturated out in the contour plot. A map like this supports interpretation in its own right, but it's also an excellent guide for excavation planning. We regularly use surveys like this for targeting excavation units, which allows us to learn quite a lot with two to three square meters of excavations. The British built Fort Edward in 1750 to monitor French and indigenous people in what is now Windsor, Nova Scotia. The last of the fort's buildings, the wooden blockhouse, is the oldest of its kind in Canada, and you can still visit it and see the soldiers' graffiti on the walls. The rest of the fort's buildings, including the soldiers' barracks and officers' quarters, survived into the 20th century but were lost to neglect. In 2014, we conducted a mapping survey inside the walls with the EM38B to see if we could recover evidence of the vanished structures. The results were pretty spectacular. Not only could we accurately map the foundations of the 18th century buildings and their chimney bases, but we detected a smear of magnetically enriched soil extending out from underneath the blockhouse. This finding, combined with the results of previous Parks Canada excavations under the blockhouse floor, suggests we're seeing the presence of a burned and demolished Acadian parish church that stood on this hill before the British built Fort Edward. For those who might be curious about the application of magnetic susceptibility to indigenous sites, I offer our results from Stars Point, Nova Scotia. This is a survey we conducted as part of our Advanced Landscape Archaeology course in 2019. This area is known to have been extensively occupied by indigenous people in ancient times, how long ago is yet to be determined, 
And we conducted an EMI survey to test the instrument's ability to detect and map hearths. Now, these are smaller targets, necessitating a relatively tight survey. The broadly varying and low-intensity magnetic feature visible here is geological, and it illustrates why it's important to survey large areas around our intended targets. Archaeological features are contextualized by ambient conditions, so the more of that surrounding environment we can see, often the better we can define and interpret targets. In this case, we detected a series of modestly scaled magnetic susceptibility features ranging from about 0.1 to 0.2 parts per thousand in magnetic susceptibility and about 1 to 2 meters in diameter, clustered at the eastern end of the field. I selected three of these for ground truthing and each yielded evidence of burning, as well as lithic debitage, proving that, at least in this environment, EMI is a reliable means of detecting hearths. Success in archaeological geophysics takes practice, but it helps to know some basics. For those of you who are just starting down this path, I'll suggest that success depends on the interplay of at least four factors. Knowing something about each of them will improve your odds of having a productive survey. 1. The instrument. Each instrument sees the world a little differently, so familiarizing yourself with the pros and cons of each will help you select the right tool for the job. Our European colleagues have produced a helpful guide to the different methods, and I'll include a link to that publication at the end of this video. 2. The setting. This includes everything from geology to site formation processes to sources of electromagnetic interference. I found EMI to be a very resilient method overall, but your results can be complicated and even compromised in urban environments where there's a lot of ferrous or otherwise magnetically susceptible debris. Watch out for this. 3. The target. It is helpful to know what you're looking for, and to have some understanding of target characteristics that might influence your choice of instrument or approach to survey. Unmarked graves, for example, are challenging at the best of times, and in my experience, GPR is probably the better system for this job than EMI. 4. Sampling Strategy Grid or no grid, tight or wide transect intervals, this one will also largely determine field time as well as the quality of the survey results. Using the previously mentioned graves as an example, and assuming an east-west grave orientation, aligning your survey transects to bisect the targets on multiple lines, for example, is preferable to an alignment with fewer target intercepts. Tighter transect intervals would also be preferable for detecting such ephemeral targets, Probably 50 centimeter interline spacing would be the widest I would recommend. Finally, many of us in Canadian archaeology have, have come to our discipline through the arts, for example, through history or anthropology. This can make remote sensing technologies seem all the more remote and difficult to get a handle on. I've been fortunate to learn from friends, and I appreciate this opportunity to share some of our results with you. If you have questions about how you might apply remote sensing, including EMI, to your work, I hope you won't hesitate to get in touch. Thanks very much for your time.